Hey, it's Rob Lumberg here, the creator and host of Uncontaminated Sound. I'm excited to introduce an amazing sponsor for Conversation 11. Author Hank Green is a number one New York Times bestselling author. His latest work, A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor, comes out tomorrow, Tuesday, July 7th. In this sequel and conclusion to his first book from 2018, An Absolutely Remarkable Thing, which is the story of a young woman thrown into fame as the world suddenly has to deal with massive changes in the form of contagious dreams and mysterious ten-foot-tall robots that have appeared in every major city. The sequel and conclusion of the story, A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor, is out to acclaimed reviews already. Library Journal's starred review said, Throughout this adventurous, witty, and compelling novel, Green delivers sharp social commentary on the power of social media in both the benefits and horrendous consequences that follow when we give too much of ourselves to technology. A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor is out July 7th in physical, audio, and ebook wherever books are sold. You can also go to hankgreen.com and pick up a copy as well. So be sure to grab one. We now come to Conversation 11, in which I speak with the very accomplished musical composer and musician, Chris Maxwell. Please enjoy. I am recording now, Chris. Thank you, sir, for uh, coming on to Uncontaminated Sound, the interviews. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you on uh, because you're just storied, uh, you know, career so far, and it's really interesting. Uh, and that's why I, I really like to talk to, you know, an eclectic group of artists and uh, artisans and uh, experts at their crafts. So oh, thank you for taking the time. How do you um, well, first, how, how are you adjusting to all this, too, like, uh, you know, with the uh, virus and all well, that? Well, <laughs> fairly well, mainly because I self-quarantine, pretty, you know, most of the time anyway, because I, I'm just, I have my studio at home, so I just work um, just 20 feet from my house, so it's not, that's not hugely different, but... Uh, but you know things like this, like I'm like I'm, I fumble Zoom or I. Uh, we've got a funny little compound here. Right at the very beginning of all this, we two of our friends from the city came up just to visit, and then and I mean they knew something was going on, but it hadn't really developed to the level it is now. And they were like, "Well, I said, we were like, come on up, hang out with us." And then they got up here, and and we've been uh, quarantined, which has been really lovely. Uh, it's this two wonderful songwriters and singers, Ambrosia Parsley and Holly Miranda. And it's fun. We're, we do these three o'clock um, Sunday brunch um, Instagram shows, which are uh, at Goat House Studio. If mm. anybody wants to tune in on, on a Sunday at three, uh, it's Eastern time. And, um, you know, uh, I'm still doing my thing. So... <laughs> Cool. How are you getting along? All right. Uh, well, you know, I've, uh, I've, uh, the last few years I've been focused on documenting, uh, live performances with the camera. So <laughs> I've had to adjust, uh, <laughs> uh, right. uh, however, I've, I started, uh, th this interview series January where I went in on location to say in studios to start talking to people and artisans and, uh, I've adjusted just nicely with the, the Zoom uh, or video conferencing regarding that. So we have an infl influx of people who just want to chat. So give, mm -hmm. but it's, um, you know, uh, all is well though. Family is safe. I'm in a good location as well. I'm up an hour outside the city. Um, and, uh, you know, all, all my family's good. So I can't complain. And I have the opportunity to chat with, uh, you know, really interesting people and uh, learn about their craft and see their perspective on what's going on now. So, yeah. Um, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're up in uh, Woodstock now, or? Cool. Yeah, I bought a house up here in 2000 and have lived up here full time since probably about 2004, to something like somewhere in that area. Wow. Wow. Um, 
I, well, it's um, I'm a member of the uh, Center of Photography of Woodstock up there. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, it's I, I, I was going up there, uh, you know, to use the digital labs and uh, the, the and the printers and stuff like that to print out my work. And I love Woodstock, the energy and stuff. And um, yeah, it's great. So it's a great location. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah I love it. I love it too. Yeah, it's it's definitely uh, home now. So, uh, and I, I lived in the city for for a while, so I, I had plenty of that. And um, and I and I love the city too. Uh, but being, it wasn't. Uh, I wasn't completely and totally in my skin there. Um, I grew up in Arkansas, yeah. and it, we're in the capital of Little Rock, you know, of Arkansas, Little Rock. Um, and it's it is a major city, but it's not like you know it's a far cry from New York City. So uh, this actually feels way more <laughs> more uh, familiar to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was gonna kind of inquire about that. I, I know you grew up in Arkansas, and I, I'm not too familiar with that the the music culture and and, and that uh, down south. I'm a Yankee. I'm I'm from Boston. Uh, you know. Um, so um could you touch upon that uh regarding how did you really begin your musical journey from it from arkansas to you know now so how, what, what really got you into it um the uh well uh, the, the the move itself was really following um it was probably a combination of several things but uh a woman that I was with at the time got a job offer in New York city and we said, let's do it. And I had, I had done a lot in Little Rock in terms of, you know, as my path with music and uh, had gotten signed. It was actually the first band in Little Rock to get uh, a major label deal uh, in 1990, 89 actually. And then the record came out in 90 on Virgin and you know we did a lot uh, you know we did a lot of cool stuff but at that point in 94 my interest in doing anything more in little rock was kind of waning a little bit and so uh she had an offer to go to new york city and we're like let's do it nice. and yeah that was 94 and i stayed there like i said for probably you know uh 20 years so hmm. what did you take from like Wrote that like it, that did you take or if anything take from that background in Arkansas and you bring it up north like to your music and to your craft um yeah um well you know there's there's a lot of things about my uh, I mean my subject matter I mean a lot of a lot of the songs that I write are rooted in my past in Arkansas uh, to either relationships or places, um, not all of it, but some of it is, and and there's that aspect of it, and then there's also the aspect of it that I am, uh, I I have formed my musical kind of taste um, around a certain um, you know culture that I grew up with, yeah. uh, being southern. Yeah. Um, I don't think of myself really as a Southern being, I, I'm in definitely influenced by, but I, you know, Americana, those things, those don't always work for me, you know, uh, at least when I listen to other things, it doesn't always make sense that to be put in that category, but I also love that, a lot of that stuff. And, um, and I know that there's a certain amount of Americana that comes through in my music, you know, probably storytelling or, uh, maybe the arrangements or the instruments I use. Hmm. Um, yeah, so when you got to New York, you you, uh, you were part of uh, Skeleton Key, correct? Um, how do you link up with those guys? So like, uh... Yeah, it was quick. I got there. Uh, I was there in 94. I got a job at the Knitting Factory, which is a, is a club, if people aren't familiar with, in New York City that was in, in, in the... 80s and 90s um it was the place for avant-garde out music uh new music whatever you'd want to call it um 
kind of headed up by John Zorn and, and then uh, kind of curated it at, at the beginning. And then I think it grew and grew. Um, anyway, I got a job there when I, right when I moved there. And that was a game changer for me. It just exposed me to so much stuff that I had never been exposed to before. Hmm. And uh, even though I probably lied and said I was familiar with all the artists that were <laughs> <laughs> we were playing at the Ning Factory I, just to get the gig because I needed a job. I probably kind of, you know, stretched it a little bit. But when I got in the job, I learned quick and I, and I uh, was uh, really excited about it. And Eric Senko was the bass player for the Lounge Lizards, um, which was one of the few groups I was familiar with um, when I moved from Arkansas. And I was doing solo shows by myself, uh, CB's Gallery, uh, Shanae, places like that. And then some people, I was doing my set, which was, I was singing these pretty conventional songs, but then the, I would just completely destroy the guitar, you know, like in the middle and then you know, trying to limp through the rest of the song after that. Yeah. Um, so there was, it was kind of fun and exciting for me to, to be able to just like rewrite all the rules for myself. And I was inspired by all this music going on around me. And Senko had saw or had heard about my, uh, my, my sets and uh, my gigs and he reached out to me and pretty early on. And, and I think by, I mean, by 96, I, we were signed and uh, I'm not sure what year the record came out of, but uh, yeah, things moved quickly. Yeah. Cool. At that, at that time, what was your like, um, you know, writing process or, you know, a musical process? Did you establish, uh, you know, uh, just a fluid process yet or, or you were just uh, picking up things and, just creating how was how was your creation process at that time and i guess right right um well you, you know uh probably two different sets of of um ways of approaching my uh my songs and my contributions with skeleton key i was definitely writing songs in the way that I'd probably always written them but i was rethinking how they were, how I put them together a little bit, uh, harmonically, uh, mainly, and I it probably a little bit subject matter too, uh, just to fit in with Eric's vision. It was really Eric's, that band was really Eric's vision. Yeah. Uh, we contributed, you know, everyone contributed a lot to it, but, but, and when I contributed songs, I sort of thought of them as in that context. And then I could come up with a fairly bare bones thing to that group. And everyone was such an incredible uh, musician and uh, inventive, you know, very creative. Uh, I could just start working on stuff with them and then it would just develop from there. Yeah. But that was, that's different from the way I would approach my own songs, which I was still writing at that time for myself, um, even though I wasn't playing them out so much. But uh, that's just a lot, that's just a lot more of just, ruminating on something for quite a while and until it's right where were you uh living in in the city at the time were you in uh manhattan or brooklyn or um i was all where over. were you residing i was all over um when i first it was manhattan at the beginning I, we moved uh, uh on to thompson street and uh in soho or kind of soho ish or um and and um got around a lot i uh, found uh, definitely lived uh, spent a lot of time in brooklyn but really a little bit more later in into the 90s um and then early 2000s uh brooklyn became more of um we, our rehearsal space skeleton keys rehearsal space was in williamsburg but that was when there was really nothing there uh, yeah. it was a, a room, other than being a Polish enclave, but it was, it was, uh, it was fun. It was a fun time. Yeah. 
Oh, well, knitting factory is still there, or I, I don't know if they moved location, but I, I've shot there several several times, and um, it's funny that they uh, recently they've kind of gone to a lot of stand up comedy, you know, <laughs> um, uh, for acts. They, they, they changed a lot, so they they moved from Forty Seven East Houston to Seventy Four Leonard Street, and I I made that move with them, and then after that, it started becoming more and different things and i think michael dorf originally started it and owned it uh i don't really know the chronology of all of it but then they started opening up ones in la and and then at some point i, I think he sold that and then he started the city winery um but they changed from being an avant-garde jazz thing into something very different from that yeah. that's what i think okay um <clears throat> so when did you kind of start to, or form also or find Phil and start uh, Elgin too as well? Like, when did you start getting into the, that uh, composer uh, and production side of things uh, from just being in a band to um, yeah. also composing? Well, Skeleton Key was, uh, went on until I think like 98 maybe. Uh, and I got tired of touring and I was really excited by all of these, uh, what was going on in, um, not just in New York City, but there was a lot going on in New York City with sampling and, and really fun, interesting beat making. And that coincided with the home audio recording explosion, the early 90s, uh, when pr studios weren't the only places where you could go to record digitally you know your stuff and that i kind of got in on the ground floor of that and then that just opened up a lot of opportunities for mix, uh, remixing and stuff with phil phil had been in a band that was um this really cool band called flux information sciences um and phil i had known from arkansas he was in a band called brave combo um in the 80s and 90s and i uh he moved to new york around the same time i did we stayed friends and then when skeleton key did a a remix only record hmm. um we took the record fantastic spikes the balloon and we to all these amazing uh remixers um christian marclay and dj spooky and uh, t-ray from cypress hill and um just a ton of really uh, interesting artists. Um, and Phil wanted to do one and we just said, sure, we don't really have any more money, but you can just do one. And if it's cool, maybe we can put it on the record. And he did the coolest one of anybody. He just blew everybody away. We were just like, what the fuck? And when I heard him doing that, it was around the time I was ready to get out of skeleton i was getting just kind of tired of doing that and um and so phil and i just we were like let's figure this shit out and we got lucky early on uh, landing remix gigs uh, and, and we had one of our first ever which was uh mixing this shivery record for capital that ended up like selling over a million records worldwide. I mean, we were, we were just additional mixers, uh, additional production on that, but it, it was a, it was a great thing to, to do to get our feet wet on. And then we went from that to um, producing some lower East side bands, like uh, the heroin sheiks and the Luna chicks uh, railroad jerk. Um, and we started doing that stuff. And that was, that was great. And Phil and I were playing live and it was starting to happen. And somewhere along the way, I think it was, I think it was, uh, they might be giants had gotten the theme song for, uh, Malcolm in the middle. And, and so Malcolm in the middle, those guys needed help with that. And they were like, Hey, can you guys write some interesting uh, cues for the show just we just need a bunch of cues and i was like sure yeah and we got into it and that sort of opened the door we were like oh wow this is fun and uh we got into it pretty heavily 
and just kind of basically formed a, a production company um, and um, still doing it and still having fun doing it. No, I, I've always been curious uh, with like, say like TV or like a uh, film um, regarding score, do they send you the clips and then you, you build off of that or is that yeah. how the process works? Yeah. That's basically it. You get a, regardless of whether it's a, a film or, t or a TV show or a commercial, whatever it is. Yeah. You, you get, you know, you'll get a, um, you'll get picture and um, you know, just depending on what it is, you know, it, it can change. There could be some music in it that people like is an idea of where they want it to go. And then that gives you an idea of what you need to be doing. Or it doesn't, you know, maybe there's just references like write some music that, you know, makes it feel like this or that. And, and then you're just, you know, pulling it out that, so yeah, that's basically it. You do definitely get picture up front. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you also have like, uh, where do you like pull your sounds from or like, do you have a library or do you like, like how do you build that or construct that, I guess, sound narrow narrative to build up to the, the visual narrative i guess uh well we do have a big library we've built it for over 20 something years and uh just instruments and things that we have access to hmm. so yeah there's just a ton of down and then you know and like and we still employ some of the some of the sampling stuff that we originally had gotten into it for um i i often will use this weird instrument called the OP1, which is like a, a little sampling box that's really it's fun and easy to use. And so we still, we still create our own sounds and then, you know, pull from crazy big libraries <laughs> that we've got. Cool. Well, it's, uh, it's funny because uh, my partner got uh, myself into the show Bob's, you know, Burgers, and it, it, I, I learned that you, you've done or still do composing with them as well yeah. for the show. Yeah. It's a, it's a funny, funny show. I had, I had yeah. A, yeah. Yeah. Um, really funny show. Yeah. No, it's, it's a real joy to work on. The people are incredible. Uh, the creator's an amazing guy and, um, and my whole family likes it. It's just not often that everybody agrees on something. So when that happens, you're like, Oh, this is good. Yeah. It, it's, I think it just shows uh, it's interesting like cartoon that shows like a working class family and you know we can all kind of relate to the the family and the the internal you know conflict with the family you freezing you froze up so i didn't really catch any of that oh so yeah I, i'm getting kind of like a shaky connection myself a bit oh you um, are i wonder if my if it's hold on a second uh could be how am I connected? Hmm. I Well, let's see. Um I think of I think I have a good connection, but um, are you yeah. still on there? Yeah, um, I'm still strong here as well, Wi-Fi wise. Maybe it's just um, I don't know. <laughs> it's uh, it issues might... with video conferencing, I guess. Sometimes you know, it's always yeah, it's never seamless. I, I figured out every every time, it's always something. <laughs> right? Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Uh, yeah. And I run a I run a um, Ethernet cable from my house to my to my studio uh, next to the house, but I've also you have the Wi-Fi on too. And I wonder sometimes if it does it have to pick which which it uses. I don't know. Um, anyway, um, let's see if we can let me know if it's if it becomes too much of a drag. We maybe we can reconnect or something. Yeah, it's it's not not too much of an issue uh, right now. Uh, there was only that pre brief uh, point where I was just saying that, uh, you know, Bob's was a, a good critique on, um, you know, kind of like a, a 
you know, working family and in the, the kind of dysfunctional internal family too, but in that uh, nifty way. But I always love how they add like music or musical aspects, elements into the show or singing and then yeah. your buskers, uh, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, the music thing is very, very uh, much a part of the show and they love it and it's fun for us. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of people that do the music. Uh, it's not just us. So there's uh, people who are contributing a lot of musical information to that show, which is awesome. Um, and, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. Now, is it you know, it's, um, kind of fun to just say interesting, uh, like uh, element to, you know, visual media. I'm more of the visual, you know, guy. Um, how does music or sound add to the, the visual experience, I guess, like uh, the story? Um, I don't know, I guess from your perspective, uh, can it evoke even more, say drama or emotion from a-, a, a, a Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, it, 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 I mean, every answer on that is, is bright. I mean, it's, sometimes it takes away from the scene. You know, there's a lot of really powerful scenes um, in cinema. I was just watching this Walter Murch uh, uh, documentary and he worked on some amazing movies. Um, uh, Godfather was one of them where the, it's a scene where Al Pacino, I can't remember the character's name, but he's about to shoot uh, the two guys in the restaurant. And there's no music during that, that scene except the sound of subways going by. And it's just incredible. Music comes in eventually after he shoots them and he walks out and the music comes in. And when it comes in, it's super powerful. Uh, but, you know, it can... Um, uh, with comedy, it's really important like it does a lot to to you know it functions they all they all affect the picture whether it's horror or drama or uh comedy or whatever it is uh music is going to have an effect it might have a it might not have a good effect but it's going to definitely have an effect um it might tell you what to feel uh, a little bit. I mean, sometimes that's what you want in comedy or, um, or, you know, or if it's horror or something, maybe you want to, if, you know, a, a movie like Jaws was just, I think, just laying there until they, until they started putting in the, uh, the John Williams score on that, 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 that drove it and made it like so intense. Mm. Uh, but you could, uh, yeah, so there's just it really depends on on what the um, what the director's looking for. Um, with Bob, with the show, with a TV show like Bob's, it's 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 fun to um, to to with comedy. You're sort of referencing things that everyone r recognizes a little bit. You know, yeah. if it's tense, you have these like strings that sound like tension, and if you you know, if it's happy, it, if the moment's happy, it's like ukulele and, and these things that are, uh, have sort of a happy takeaway to them. But you want that because it's, it's a, the, the music's not important other than the fact that it's there to kind of serve the story. If it's a story or if it's a joke or whatever it is, the music is there to serve it. So you just use whatever you need to use to, you know, reference. Now, how did you, um, I, I've noticed you've done a bunch of uh, comedy shows as well. Uh, how did you get into that, you know, sector? Did, did you just do, you know, Bob's and then people started picking up on your, you guys uh, work or how did yeah. you get into? We were doing, uh, we, were, we did a lot of comedy stuff before. And I don't know how that really happened in the very beginning. We worked with the, the creator of Bob's very early on uh before he did like even like a, a home movie and all that stuff he did a pilot with us called saddle rash um and then it was years later when we we hooked up for bobs but i don't remember exactly how we ended up 
We, oh, well, I mean, yeah, dude, because we, I mean, I, <laughs> I just a lot of ton of friends that were comedians and hmm. which was funny in itself because I wasn't really like a comedy club going guy. I never really did that a lot when I first got to New York, but I ended up meeting a lot of people through a friend of mine who was in, who played in a rock band. Uh, she's in a band now called Tigers and Monkeys. Uh, she's a Southern person that, uh, from Georgia who, or is she from Nashville? Wait, I'm screwed up. Uh, sh she was friends with a ton of comedians, uh, Shanali Bomick. And uh, so she introduced me to a lot of people and yeah. So um, it was really through those relationships that it, I started building, you know, um, up these TV shows that we were doing. Cool. Yeah, I, I've actually have, uh, recently started covering or capturing uh, com comedians myself, like uh, Sinbad, Louie Anderson. I get, you know, backstage you know, portraits and intimate portraits and stuff like that. So I find uh, the medium um, or the art and craft, I guess, uh, fascinating as well, because I, like yourself, I was never like in going to the comedy clubs, but uh, I'm I'm really starting to appreciate the craft now. Um, once I've started meeting, uh, you know, people in in the in the trade. Um, so yeah, I, I was kind of yeah really curious about yeah how you you kind of built off that and then, you know, like Amy Schumer's like the, the milk milk lemonade. So hilarious, you know, <laughs> that was great. Um, so <laughs> that's cool. It's yeah yeah, yeah we just. It was just, a, uh, yeah, we went to this club called Rafifi on 11th Street and between it's like 11th, between um, 1st and A or something in, in, in lower Manhattan. And um, and my friend Bobby Tisdale and Eugene Merman, both who are now on Bob's Burgers, uh, they ran a, a comedy show there called uh, Invite Them Up. And... Uh, I just hung out there a lot and, and met a lot of people. It was a really fun time. Yeah, yeah. Now, well, did you ever see yourself, like, or your career evolving like this? Like, from Arkansas to New York City to being in a very popular band to, you know, kind of pr producing, you know, very popular shows and, and stuff like that. Or, well, scoring popular shows and stuff like that. Did you have that in a vision or are you just like let things just evolve from uh, things evolved. I didn't, I didn't see myself doing um, television and film stuff when I started out doing playing in bands. Um, you know, as you got, as you get older playing in bands, you do start trying to imagine other ways to, you know, continue to write music and also make a living. Hmm. Um, and I think for a lot of people, this is has turned out to be you know a good option, uh, and it's great for me because uh, you know I still get to make my own music, I still get to produce other people, uh, but it, you know I'm also my day gig's not so bad. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> it's cool. I mean, I know a lot of people or younger kids that would love to do what you're doing uh, regarding composing scores for shows, of course. Um, regarding your solo stuff, like, you know, I, I believe, if I'm correct, uh, Arkansas Summer was released 2016. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I've noticed there, uh, I listened to, you pull a lot from your, your past. And when did you, like, decide you were ready to write, write about your, your, you know, kind of past and uh, struggles and uh, into uh, song, I guess. Um, well, I mean, it, it was, um, I think I probably always did it a little bit, but I, I don't think I thought about it as much. And then when my son was born in 2007, that just kind of throws you into a different place mentally, you know, a different place in your head. And, um, and yeah, and I think that, that, that sort of, I got overwhelmed by that. And, and, uh, these, these experiences in my life started to bubble up and 
that that's how that album took shape was um thinking about those relationships and um where i where my family still is uh, in little rock um or outside of little rock and um and then when i went to album two i kind of thought i might be done with that aspect of of my uh writing hmm. but there uh, more things came out and it was it became clear that i was i had more stuff to to write on that with that subject i mean i i'm also very you know i'm just influenced by a lot of singer songwriters um that came out of the the early 70s mid 70s um that would sing very personal songs um that meant something to them and i think when you sing something that means something to you you're you're it's it's universal in that regard that you know you know you're telling a story that probably everybody has similar stories um so a lot of that stuff you know bill withers you know grandma's hands you know or you know lennon's uh Ono band record and uh, so many, so many albums like that, that uh, Joni Mitchell, Neil Young, so much of that stuff really kind of played into my aesthetic a lot. Hmm. And I think that's probably what those records are. Those two records that I did are, are sort of an homage to a little bit. Hmm. Hmm. I believe uh, in New Store, uh, number two, you reference your grandfather. Is that Yeah, correct? yeah. Um, and he, he, he was, uh, moved from Lebanon to Arkansas. And yeah. What, what, uh, he, he opened up a shop, a shop. What, what type of shop? Uh, it was like, um, a dry goods store, you know, he sold, uh, work, mostly work clothes to, to the local blue collar folks around there. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's mostly what it was. Do you, did you ever were you close with him? You or is he is he still alive? Or uh... oh, no, no, he passed away in eighty four. But oh. um, you know, it, it was hard to get close to him in the way that maybe you're referring to. Hmm. Um, we don't nobody family. I felt like was he had a very strange. You know, his English never got very good. So after he moved from Lebanon to here he he never it was serviceable you know like a really pigeon english you know where it's good enough to basically sell somebody a shirt or a pair of pants but um so i think there was a, always a language barrier between him and the rest of the family uh but he was sort of a character too that just like looms large in my in my memory and and when I'd go back and think about like him being an immigrant and how he was treated and and having his store pre Walmart and what 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 all that is and so yeah it was um, he was a big person in my early development you know even though we weren't like it wasn't like grandfather and you know like it wasn't like he took me fishing or anything but yeah 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 I've uh... I've kind of been reflecting on a, a kind of similar notes. Like I never got to meet my mother's grandparents uh, because they died when she was younger. But apparently, you know, uh, my mother's father had a really interesting story. I would love to document and, uh, you know, maybe create a, a, you know, maybe a documentary or something like that. You know, so I'm at the, mm -hmm. I'm at that kind of stage too of reflecting on, uh, you know, the past and, really saying you know maybe these people's uh stories should be told as well you know yeah. uh, because it's like you realize it's like after my mother my passes uh, she's still around but um but uh you realize it's like w once that story's lost it's lost for good so if right. as a artist uh i can put it into my own type of you know my medium and tell that story in my way and my expression it's like that kind of you you know it gives it uh that person longevity or more right know. yeah yeah um, yeah sure. do you ever uh so you 
are you gonna like 50 percent? are you lebanese i get you i guess you're lebanese it's a quarter lebanese or? yeah 20, yeah yeah my, it's just my grandfather yeah my my grandmother was a um well it was the the rest of them were you know just a mix Heinz 57 hmm. um yeah it's um that's cool so also like where do you um kind of see you know do you, you envision other albums coming out or are you focused on more production or um, no making you know in the, the record itself is a kind of a weird uh thing now um i i don't know for sure if it would be take the same form as uh a, like a 10 song album uh vinyl a side b side kind of thing or if it's just more you know like just a constant stream of things i'm not really totally sure but i mean it's what i do so and i enjoy it yeah yeah um do you uh, well you're you're still busy you, you know i are you still i guess the question is have you been affected drastically in your workflow due to this covid thing or um Not drastically but yeah for sure i mean it's gonna and it, we don't really know what the fallout's gonna be still yet but definitely affected and but definitely lucky that I, there's still things that we're still working on bob's is a um um moving forward with its season and so yeah it's um i feel yeah i feel pretty lucky actually right now yeah or well, i could imagine with say like animation you you can self-contain like the illustrators and then they can just pass along you know the the you know video to yourself and you're already in you know contained as well and just you know work like that but, yeah, i guess live action you know with the Live action would be quite oh, different. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're having a problem with that. Yeah. Um, so, I guess, I don't know, like, um, well, have you seen the industry, like, music, and uh, it evolve into any positive trends? Or, because I know I've talked to a lot of musicians as well, they're like, you know, kind of adverse to the digital age and stuff like that and um with the new trends and stuff like uh you know online and, and everything being digital and really you can just self-produce um mm -hmm. have you found that beneficial or have you kind of like missed the old ways of production a bit i don't know well i mean uh yes and no i mean i uh i work entirely digitally i don't do anything that's that's um i mean i everything goes in analog i mean or, or, i mean it starts out analog and it, then it goes in and converts to a digital signal but um you know i made my records to be experienced in the way that we the way i kind of grew up experiencing music which was more you were more deliberate about what you what you listen to and you know you listen to it thoroughly and that's i think we live in an age now where that's it's it, people listen to music differently than that i don't i don't really want to qualify it as being you know good or bad uh it's just it's a different way of consuming music mm. um um I I personally like I try to spend as much time as I can with with an artist record that they spent you know a long time making, and not just like breeze through it uh, or just put it into a Spotify playlist. But um, I mean that's changing everything. How you know the it's taking the value of music down a little bit or a lot. You know uh, people are not buying music as much as they could because. Um, because they can get it for free, you know, basically. So those things are all having a huge Im impact on on artists. But you know, artists will be artists, and they'll just figure something out. And you know, that's what that's just that's just going to continue to always be that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, when it comes to you kind of live performance, be studio. Are you do you preference like one experience than the other? Like, do you prefer more recording aspect and 
uh, in studio comparatively to kind of live performance or or is there a difference I don't know um I like both a lot I mean I I get I can get tired of either also really quickly uh um if I'm doing the same thing over and over again so it really depends I love recording I love setting up and, and making music um but you know live is a is is still a ton of fun yeah I, I play with some really good musicians so it that also helps yeah now do you have you ever done sets like at colony up there or um yeah know? my album release party was at colony oh cool i, I really dig that venue I, I captured uh ted leo there and it was like it's a really cool atmosphere like kind of a western saloon kind of type thing yeah or deck and yeah super intimate too but really cool place yeah yeah um yeah i guess uh really uh man i guess i um ask my questions man like sorry i'm, I'm, I'm uh, hitting, I, hitting I, a blank <laughs> sorry I, I i mean it's probably a good time for me to yeah. to wrap anyway it's at f five so yeah i gotta um but yeah thanks for doing it and uh yeah let me know when you get it done and then i'd love to check out how you how it came out yeah thank you so much for your time uh chris um well it, it's hard to like you know edit it's just going to be i guess the output from zoom is just going to be side by side kind of oh, yeah. uh, pictures right. it's like that's why i loved going in studio and having the camera and i can frame myself but I'll probably edit just in black and white to keep it consistent with my other uh, right. interviews, but I, it's 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 pretty limited, you know. It's uh, kind of where no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Doc, just documenting the moment, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, once again, thank you so much for your time and uh, enjoy the afternoon and be well and safe and stuff too. Same to you, yeah. And everyone that listens to your show, hopefully, is um, staying safe. Take care, Chris. Thank you. Let's see, this is the hardest part.